So our speaker today is uh, Jay Englishby, who um, we have gotten to know over the last year as a, a wonderful um, new face and presence um, in our fellowship. I personally am really grateful to Jay. I'm always inspired um, by his sharings. And when I saw that he was going to be speaking today, I jumped right in because I wanted to facilitate um, this service. So Jay has been a Galveston UU member for the past year. He has a wide range of interests, including art, anthropology, justice, and ecological restoration, and how they intersect in the tangled web of life. Jay's program today is What If Comfort. Jay? Hey, and by the way, I was so excited to know that you were the facilitator because you make everything so eloquent and sweet and just, uh, everyone connects with you. I'll say that. So, fun day we're having, isn't it? It feels like the opposite of nostalgia, uh, seeing everyone on a little tile on Zoom. And I've had to quickly change some things in my talk this morning to make it a little bit more Zoom compatible. So uh, bear with me if it isn't quite as relevant as if it were in person. So I'd like everyone to shift in your seat a little bit and get comfortable. Okay. Really comfortable. Are you actually in the position that you prefer? Or did you decide to sit that way because you know how others usually orient themselves? Are you worried about uncrossing your legs in a way you were scolded for as a child, even though sitting comfortably harms no one? Now close your eyes. Pay no attention to how anyone else usually sits. Now really get comfortable. Cross or relax your legs in a way you normally reserve for your couch at home. Uh, experiment with your arm position and find what suits your shoulders at this moment. Crack your neck, grab a pillow, or bunch up your jacket to support some part of you that needs it. What seems like a simple request has a deeply rooted weight that we carry without realizing how much of an impact it makes on our daily lives. Confronting that means acknowledging all the times that we unnecessarily put ourselves into positions that contributed to our tense backs and shoulders. You're still in your own personal space, not taking anything from anyone, not making anyone's life worse by sitting in a way that doesn't hurt you. This is not about sitting though. Memories, tradition, and societal pressure are often wounds that never get to scab over. Whether that is how we shrink our individuality, choose to decorate ourselves, or our spirituality, by thoroughly examining and criticizing these thoughts, we can let the wounds we got so used to always weeping begin to scar. I will begin this with a disclaimer being autistic has given me more of an outside looking in perspective on how people define themselves. As a child, I wanted to be liked, of course, uh, but not to the point that I would be willing to crush my spirit into the form that I was expected to. This eventually led to an immersion on the wonder into the wonderful world of anthropology and a hell of a lot of questions about why people behave the way they do. I never got any satisfying answers from the adults I asked, though, as these were the unwritten rules of society that my brain never got the memo about. And eventually, finally, I realized what motivated most actions, the fear of discomfort. When everyday events become a checklist, an autopilot turns on, we get what we think is comfortable the predictability lets us coast along and deviating from it, even if the current path is not the one that we would prefer, seems almost unfathomable. Too much work, too much fear, too many obligations. Questioning why we make certain choices 
if the things we grew up with are still relevant to our lives and how we can become a more free flowing version of ourselves may not seem no worth it after all for many parts of life we made it this far by behaving the way that we always have whether we end up with a completely different perspective afterwards or come back to the same place we started our questioning the process gives birth to a better understanding of what we really want out of life. The people in this room, Zoom room, most likely have had a bit more experience questioning their spirituality than the general population. Every one of us has a story, and while many might have a similar starting point and present, the steps along the way can be vastly different. <clears throat> when I was a young child, I attended a certain mega church <laughs> with family. Big productions, a giant theater, 50 foot tall screens because people having to sit so far back that they can't see the stage. And it's very own gift shop. Hearing it. Damn it. Is the sound coming through? Um. I, wa I wasn't even in that area usually because one of the youth buildings was a gymnasium-sized megalith with a mezzanine that had its very own Texas Jesus version of an arcade and a snack bar. It was the perfect recipe to make the kids feel like they were part of something really, really important with an authority that shall not be second-guessed. The sermons... Uh, well, they taught less relevant lessons than the average episode of Tom and Jerry. I was baptized in a heated pool overlooking one of the two giant blue ponds with fountains and genuinely had no idea what the ritual really meant, despite being given a rundown. I was one of roughly a hundred kids being dunked on that particular Sunday and simply felt weird standing outside in wet clothes with strangers congratulating me whenever it was all over with. I've blocked out a lot of these memories, but one, of the, one that truly stands out to me was crying in the main theater during some service, thinking I was going to hell because I accidentally killed my favorite tree frog who lived behind a wall hanging on our back porch by not making sure that he was out of the way of the edge of the siding before putting the decor back where it went. That was what I got out of it, as a young child who was being torn between my own morals and a fear of punishment that was being instilled by that church. It didn't take too long for that fear to subside after I started getting shut down over innocent questions about inconsistencies and religion became a topic of arguments because nobody would have any real conversations or open to themselves to the possibility that we do not know everything. Because if I knew one thing, it was that I actually know nothing. Everything that I learn about leads to even more questions. Out of over 10,000 distinct religions, how could I choose one with any confidence, especially with every single person insisting that they were the only one who knew the truth and how dare I make them uncomfortable with this topic. So I say if you ever want to alienate a child, treat their curiosity as blasphemy. Religion wasn't just put on a back burner. It had been on the stove for so long that it had turned to coal. But that wasn't the only option. I realized that I did not have to choose and that the original intent of every religion basically boiled down to don't be a donkey sphincter, don't place material wealth over the moment, and please don't eat the things that will give you parasites. <laughs> Suddenly, with the fire removed, I was back to being that child who just wanted that beautiful little frog to live, to look at pretty trees and marvel at the fractal geometry of their branches, and to make other people's lives a little less bad. And slowly, very slowly, my own tangible version of my connection to the universe started to creep in. Fresh ingredients for a less charred spiritual soup. Years passed, and my most life-changing moments occur occurred while sitting with friends, having philosophical conversations, 
while taking turns balancing on a slack line and passing around a ridiculously heavy glass jug of water in the summer heat. Nothing was off limits. At a park, we questioned human nature. In a corner of a tea house, we, di we discussed how we are all deeply flawed people just trying to find happiness. Later, we discussed what happiness really meant. Never found an answer for that. At a drum circle, we talked about how time keeps moving faster and faster and the point pointlessness of wasting it climbing the social ladder. And how respectability, being a motivator, can be extremely limiting, limiting to the soul. At a communal house, we pondered how many things were swept under the rug to maintain the status quo. At a bookstore, we softly discuss, discussed biochemistry. By a creek, we talked about how dang annoying shoes are. It was not all meaningful, but uh, nothing was off limits. <laughs> By embracing the uncomfortable topics, we found comfort. By opening ourselves to the possibility that what we were shaped by <clears throat> isn't the end all be all of information, we found gaps that we didn't even know existed and filled them with a love of what was right in front of us. I found that the more I talk about it, the more gaps I find, and the more work on my personal philosophy that gets added to the list. The more work, the more comfortable I feel. This comes from the heart of the Buddha's teachings. Don't throw away your suffering. Touch your suffering. Face it directly and your joy will become deeper. You know that suffering and joy are both impermanent. Learn the art of cultivating joy. Practice like this and you will become, you will come to the third turning of the third noble truth, the realization that suffering and happiness are not two. When you reach this stage, your joy is no longer fragile. It is true joy. So after this talk and before the closing words, I'd like some of, if some of y'all would share how your own spirituality has evolved. You'll get time after I say the word thank you. So, <clears throat> pardon me. Using this same process of questioning everything, I have accepted that there is no static version of me and there never will be. It's funny. Uh, last month I had to write a bio and a couple of sentences to accompany the title of this talk for the monthly newsletter and I was absolutely stumped, procrastinated until the last minute, typed in a race over and over again before coming up with something that I thought was kind of sort of okay. I looked back at the past weeks of those speakers' bios and saw everything from school and work titles to hobbies to naming their family members. That inspired the second half of this talk. I don't think, <clears throat> I promise that is not coughing. That is just me not being used to talking for this long in a row. <laughs> I don't think anyone has the ability to define themselves in a hundred paragraphs, let alone two or three sentences, even if they feel that they do. And I think that's wonderful. The you that existed decades ago is so long gone, you may not even feel a connection to them. The you from two years ago had no idea what strife was on the way. The you from this morning isn't even the same you sitting here right this minute. So what changed along the way? Questioning what shaped us as individuals is even more of an upheaval than a spiritual journey. Bear with me, I'm going to talk about seating positions again, this time not metaphorically though. It seems like it's such a ridiculous thing to focus on, right? But it's an example of all the little cuts that we accumulate through time. It seems like every, everyone you come across has some sort of input on the way you sit when you're a child. Too stiff, too relaxed, too fruity, not feminine enough, Misplaced elbows, fiddling hands, not proper, not giving off the impression of anticipation and interest, seeming too interested and anxious. It can feel endless. And while it may seem innocuous, innocuous each of these creates a weight that carries over to other parts of our identities, 
We can feel defined by it in that very moment. I don't know a single person who hasn't given up a perfectly benign part of themselves to please others who, quite frankly, should not give a shit about someone else's harmless actions. So I want to ask you all, which hobbies have you left behind? Which styles? Which friends? Which habits? What ways did these represent you? And is your life better or worse for their lack of presence? What have you picked up on? And what impact has that made? What would you like to adopt in the future? When you recognize that the cause of each action action, the origin of your hesitation or shame, that you can begin to see what parts are really the current you by choice and which ones are there just because. You are not as simply the accumulation of events that have led you here, just as you are not the things you do or the, things you, the words that you say. You can attempt to let go of the mind clutter and with that the weight of needless expectations. It is an exhausting and never-ending process, but it is so very rewarding, again and again. The thoughts we create that lead to building a more intentional life impact us just as greatly as the ones that were forced upon us. And let me be clear, this, no, this by no means implies that people have the choice to do away with mental illness and trauma. No matter how at peace I am with myself, there are events I cannot move past, and a lovely chemical imbalance that has left me chronically depressed and fighting suicidal ideation for over half my life. I actively choose to continue and to fight for a better future. That is my choice. The events that led to now are not me. The events that you have experienced do not define your soul. You, despite whatever impacted your past, are alive right here, right now. It isn't something that has always been perfect, and some of it may very well have torn us apart as it forcefully entered our lives, our country, or the world itself. Everyone feels each moment with a different intensity and emotion. We can learn about ourselves and others if we let go of the idea that we are definable. We can learn that love for oneself and others is not a noun, but a verb that has to constantly be acted upon. Every action has been inf influenced by something. Previous experience, personal bias, ego, stubbornness, wisdom, envy, kindness. It's up to you to figure out the reason and encourage others to do the same. And so I embrace it as a way to grow. Ever evolving, finding every strange place I set foot upon can be home. Every silent moment, an opportunity for reflection. Every angry word directed my way, an insight into another's pain. No matter how much it hurts, discomfort is what truly leads to comfort. And the liberty of that, accepting change as a constant, self as a fluid, and decay as a, being a beautiful inevitability, makes me feel like a cat basking in a sunny window. So here's my real bio for this talk. Since I've just spouted a bunch of stuff that makes me sound like I'm trying to be a monk, I am an accumulation of energy, temporarily ma manifesting as matter, with a bit too much cortisol, not enough oxytocin, and I really like lizards. They're awesome. <laughs> so in conclusion, we erase not the wounds of our history, rather, rather we finally allow them to heal and be a testament to our past without the glory. Thank you.